right. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, as Seth mentioned, this is a, this is a little break from uh, the LLMs and Gen AI we've been seeing all day today. And we're going to focus uh, on, yep, again, applying AI to robotics to um, enable them to be used in industrial applications. Uh, and so a quick introduction, I'm a research engineer at Siemens. Um, our group focuses, uh, again, on <laughs> applying AI to robotics. Uh, in this case, like computer vision, reinforcement learning, and uh, exploring uh, novel areas in which, in industry where you know, tasks are usually manual and we can apply these more novel methods to uh, enable automation in these uh, tougher areas. Um, and hi everyone, I'm Kyle. I'm also a research engineer at Siemens and we work closely together on these computer vision topics but also MLOps, data management topics. And together with our extended team in Berkeley, we try and, yes, exactly, solve these robotics AI for industrial applications. Now, actually, before I go to the next slide, may I ask the audience how many of you were either maybe able to attend NVIDIA GTC last month or see Jensen Huang's keynote speech? Yeah, that's a good number of hands. Um, and at least as, as a spoiler, I guess, for those who haven't seen it, the most interesting part for us was his highlight um, of robotics. He brought up towards the end um, this whole array of robots, including humanoid robots, and really highlighted how important robotics is gonna be in the next few years and coming decade, as highlighted by this quote from his um, shareholder call a few months ago as well. Um, in fact, there's a management consulting agency called Gartner, and towards the end of last year, they also highlight the importance of smart robots. And they say that by 2028, there will be more smart robots than frontline workers in manufacturing, retail, and logistics, which only underscores the growth of robotics in the coming years. Yeah, so um, there, there's definitely a lot of hype in robotics as well, especially the humanoid sector. But I guess the, the big question here is, you know, how, how do we make this work? Um, and so um, I usually like to focus on a more foundational um, kind of skill, which is picking. And picking is definitely a very prevalent skill. So if you look at that quote by, from Randy Brooks, which is the funder of iRobot, uh, he says that you know, picking will be uh, quite prevalent in you know, um, <coughs> factories, warehouses, and homes. And so, yeah, let's just try to figure out how can we get picking to work with robotics. And um, a nice way to look at it is to make a human analogy. And so um, if you look at this diagram, I think the main thing you wanna focus on is there's a person that sees a coffee, you know, a cup of coffee on the table and is going to grab it. And so if we break it down, right, um, the person sees the coffee on the table, so their eyes pick up visual signal, their brain processes the visual signal, and then the, the brain converts this visual signal into actions for the muscle to execute. And then this person goes and picks up the cup of coffee on the table. But you know, this part about the brain, you know, that it's able to convert this visual signal into muscle actions, right? This is kind of a tricky thing to do or to understand. And you know, for us, paradoxically speaking, like picking up a cup of coffee on the table is really simple, but you know, this mechanism for doing this is kind of hard to understand. And so this kind of brings in the second quote where um, these uh, tasks that seem simple are paradoxically uh, very hard to implement. Um, and so um, now let's bring this back into the realm of robotics. So if we take this human analogy, we can kind of use the same breakdown. And so on the left, you see that uh, we talk about an RGBD camera and this kind of uh, corresponds to our eyes, right? Our eyes can perceive color and also it can perceive depth. That's very important. And so um, in the industry, there are cameras that can uh, not only take you know, color pictures, but they can also sense depth. Um, so like a popular brand, I think people, some people may be aware of are, are like Intel RealSense cameras. Um, and then on the right side, you know, we have, you know, the physical arm. And so instead of a human arm, we have a robot arm. And then on the end of the robot arm, there's like a gripper. So, you know, they can come in many form factors. They can be suction cups, they can be two finger grippers, or they can also be, uh, you know, like a full uh, dexterous five finger gripper. And then, you know, the secret sauce is really in the middle, right? Like, how do we get these cameras to connect with the robots in a meaningful way? Or, you know, have the, you know, basically we need some form of vision software that can convert or process these visual signals 
and then turn them into uh, valuable actions that the robot can execute. Right, but say we have this robotic brain, why is it needed? What is the motivation behind it and what's especially the economic motivation behind it? Um, and considering that we're in this realm of warehouse automation, there's largely two, um, two, two sectors. One is manufacturing and one is interlogistics. Now what is manufacturing? Manufacturing is basically taking part one, two, three, four, five, which are known, and then assembling them together in some way, right? And you can see in this quote over here, 38% of the labor force in the US in manufacturing move parts between bins and manufacturing machines. And more than 500,000 of these jobs will remain unfilled. Why will they remain unfilled? What's so difficult about getting these workers to do these tasks, right? And they should be willing to do it. Well, one is that labor is expensive. And two is that these tasks are just really monotonous. They're repetitive and they can lead to um, bodily harm, depending on the objects you deal with or depending on the motion, right? But demand's gonna keep increasing for goods and services. And on the other side, you have interlogistics. And interlogistics is the movement of goods um, within a warehouse, right from the point when they come in to when they leave, right? And in 2027, there will be five million full-time employees um, that will perform these repetitive tasks. And these tasks comprise 30 to 55% of a warehouse's costs. So that's the economic motivation. But if you go one step deeper to the technical side, what is the difference between manufacturing and interlogistics? As I mentioned, manufacturing deals with known objects. You know what's coming beforehand. And when I say known, it's known in the sense, okay, you have a three geometry, you have a CAD model, and encoded in this, you will have maybe grasping points. And this makes the whole process of picking something much easier. Whereas for intralogistics, um, it's largely unknown. Um, think of Amazon. If all of us order something here today, think of the variance in the number of objects and type of objects you would be seeing. And these are only known once you see it. So the software really has to be very adaptable and flexible. And the way we classify this is something called model-free picking. Um, in, in this image here, you can see just a few CAD models. It's from a very popular data set called the YCB data set. But it, it just gives an understanding of the, the kind of variety of objects that you could um, encounter. And our goal is this flexible um, system that can understand really the skill of picking. And it's, it's a challenging skill, as Brian mentioned but you can um, try and understand it through these four criteria. So one is you really need to pick something at its center of mass. So if you look at this middle object, on, uh, middle row on the, on the left, imagine if you pick it and it's heavy on an extreme end. Um, the top would just cause it to fall down, right? And if it falls down, that's a failed pick. And a failed pick reduces your picks per hour and that's not good for a warehouse. Um, secondly, it's a flat surface. So if you look at um, the bottom row on the extreme right, this object has holes. Um, in warehouses, you deal with suction grippers and you need a successful seal formation. Now given these holes, they're not gonna seal correctly and they just drop back down again, which increases the, the challenge of this problem. Um, thirdly, you have object rigidity, right? It's not only rigid objects like this that you will see in, in a conveyor or in a bin. They could be um, packaged cloth t-shirts, jeans, anything. Um, and, and the challenge with that is it's very deformable. So once you pick something up, um, it, it could change shape, which really compounds the first two problems. And lastly, it's a robotic system. You need to not collide with either the bin or the object. Uh, these, these picking systems move at very high speeds. So if you collide with the bin, it could move it out of bounds. If you collide with an object, it might either you know, damage the robot or damage the object, which is not good as well. All right, so that's a great explanation of kind of the variance we uh, usually experience in the interlogistics scenario. So now the question is, okay, how do we um, address this flexibility? How do we build a system that's flexible enough to handle all these objects and scenarios? And so um, the first thing we need is we kind of need some uh, accuracy, physical accuracy. And we do this with some simulations where we kind of um, look at, you know, like we kind of test in simulation. We have these meshes, as you've seen, um, up top. And then, you know, you have 
some robot in simulation. They try to, they sample some grasps and they see if it works or not. And then you can kind of build these um, uh, kind of pick points or like known pick points that are good. And then you can start uh, generating various scenarios. So in the middle, so we generate lots of synthetic scenarios with all kinds of object arrangements and all kinds of object meshes. Um, and so this kind of provides the data volume we need to um, get some like initial momentum uh, to, for a model that's flexible enough. And so we first train a model that can fit to this kind of uh, synthetic data. And then, um, so, but synthetic data is kind of like too perfect. You know, um, if you ever look at renderings, they kind of, you can kind of get this feeling it's not quite what it looks like in the real world. And um, this is especially true for depth images, uh, which are often much more noisy. Uh, for, you know, when you run a simulation, right, you could just easily grab the depth buffer and then just that turns into your depth image. But for a camera, they have to, you know, calculate the disparity and then get some depth values out of that. So this is much more noisy. And so what we got to do is we have to make the depth images noisy as well. And then on top of that, you know, um, we also introduce a lot of fine tuning, real world fine tuning. And so we do a lot of data collection uh, in the real world as well. Um, we are looking to uh, boost our data collection at customer sites as well. Uh, and so with that, we can continue to retrain our model on uh, newer SKUs, stock keeping units, um, and also introduce our model to much more variety. And we would also like to just uh, give a side note and say like weights and biases has been really helpful uh, and throughout this whole process of training our models. Um, you know, they have this data set tracking, all their artifact logging, um, models registries, and also just like being able to link your models and visualize everything uh, in tables. This, is, uh, this has given us a lot of uh, information about what models do work, what models don't work, and it's been able to let us iterate much more quickly. And so, um, you know, after all this like time uh, spent, you know, training models, you know, in the end, we still need to do a lot of testing um, because, you know, in the end, customers, they need some hard numbers. Uh, they need to know how fast, how efficient our systems can work. And so we do a lot of testing in the lab. And on top of this testing, as we mentioned, we do a lot of data collection and we often spend a lot of time selecting this data to see which ones the model struggle, our perception model struggles on and um, continue to iterate on, uh, continue to iterate our models. And so, um, as recently as last year, we've uh, been able to um, push out uh, a new product called Semantic Robot Pick AI. Um, and so let me break down this uh, product for you. So Semantic stands for Siemens um, Factory Automation Portfolio, which mainly consists of these PLCs and IPCs. So PLCs are pro programmable logic controllers and IPCs are industrial PCs. And so in, if you imagine in a warehouse, these PLCs and um, IPCs would be powering like the conveyor belts and the robots that uh, will be automating the picking task for us. And, um, and so uh, we, so that's a lot of testing. And so um, now like, do we have, now like we wanna see, okay, does it work in the real world? And so we're really grateful to have a lot of pilot customers who are very interested in semantic robot pick AI. One example here is Mechalux, which is a, a large, you can kind of imagine it as like the Amazon of Spain or Europe. So they are a very large interlogistics company and uh, we've been working with them to integrate Semantic Robot Pick AI uh, into their robot picking system. And um, yeah, the results do seem to look pretty good, but I think there's still uh, a lot of data collection and improvement uh, that can come along. All right, and now the natural next question is, once you pick something, what do you do with it, right? It's in the suction cup. Um, there's you know, n number of downstream tasks you can do with it but one of them is actually placing it or packing it, which is what we call somatic robot pack AI, which enables packing of unknown objects, right? So you can see here in the system, um, it's, it's picking up something using pick AI from this spin. Now it needs to estimate the object's dimensions. And once it's able to understand the object's dimensions, um, it has to pack them. Now you can imagine this in a warehouse. This is a uh, you know, live test that we conduct but it can be coming in any arrangement, it can come in on a conveyor belt, or you know, not necessarily a chaotic, it could be sequential as well. And if you look carefully at the um, packing, it's not just packing it haphazardly, it's following a sequence, and it's actually very tight packing. So there's very little gap between the objects. And this is very important because you don't wanna just drop it in a bin or just place it anywhere in a bin. It needs to, um, 
fulfill certain um, fill rate criteria, you need to maximize um, how much volume of this bin that you can actually fill up. Otherwise, it's inefficient. So the combination of robot PKI and robot PAKI is really providing solutions for, um, for our customers. And finally, um, given that this is a generative AI conference, um, we couldn't miss highlighting the work that we are also doing in Gen AI. Um, but I will focus a little bit on the robotics portfolio, the robotics AI portfolio. So in the image on the right, um, the gentleman in the forefront is actually Roland Bush, who is the CEO of Siemens. And he was interacting with um, our PKI and PACAI systems. Um, but the key thing to notice here in the, in the screen in the background, there is this industrial co-pilot that's also running. And why is this useful? It's useful because these are running in warehouses. In warehouses, the technical experts are very far removed, right? These operators on the front line, they need to be able to know if something goes wrong, what happened? So you can just query this co-pilot and ask, hey, this pick failed, what's going wrong? This camera's not working, what's going wrong? If anything's going wrong, it's real-time troubleshooting, which is very helpful for the operators. And secondly, um, there's another added benefit, which is um, PLC programming or PLC code generation. Now, PLC code generation is, is a bit of a niche. It's not in Python or um, any known language that um, we, we would be familiar with. It's, um, it's an expertise that fewer and fewer developers are actually comfortable with. So imagine having this co-pilot by your side, but if you need to make a fix or actually generate a new feature, um, this is there to help you and do it in a very efficient way. And of course, these are just two of the um, um, products on the uh, Gen AI side that we're working on. Um, but given Siemens' collaboration with many companies, um, we hope that this leads to a brighter future for not only our robotics portfolio, but also integrated with generative AI. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And of course, to Weights and Biases as well for all of their support throughout this.